Interestingly, this weekend, we find ourselves in Acts chapter 5, which is where we see for the very first time people in the church act selfishly instead of selflessly. Choose self over God. It's the first time we see people choose the flesh over the spirit. Okay, so I want to share a message with you called Integrity is Everything. Write that down. Integrity is everything. And this whole sermon in one sentence is this. Jesus is coming back for a pure and spotless bride. Can I get an amen? How many of you have heard that phrase before, that Jesus is coming back for a pure and spotless bride? Yeah, there's several passages of Scripture in the Bible that tell us that the church is the bride of Christ. But I want to clarify something this morning. Okay, and you, and you may be shocked, but in a good way, hopefully. The church will never be spotless because it's made up of fallible people who are on the journey of leaving behind the flesh and walking according to the Spirit. Let me say that again. The church will never be spotless because it's made up of fallible people who are on the journey of leaving the flesh behind and living according to the Spirit. Well, Pastor Tony, I, just, I thought we just read that. This is a whole sermon in a sentence. That Jesus is coming back for a pure and spotless bride. I'm confused. Listen, pure and spotless is not a reference to who we are. It's a reference to who Jesus is. Jesus is the pure and spotless Lamb of God who was slain. Do you understand? So Jesus isn't coming back for a perfect people, because we'll never be perfect. He's coming back for those who, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, who have confessed with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and has believed in their hearts that God raised him from the dead. Those who have been saved. He's coming back for those who, Ephesians chapter 4, are walking in a manner worthy of the calling which they have been called. Okay, so let's, let's rephrase this whole sermon in one sentence, and let's say it this way. Jesus is coming back for his people of integrity. Now, when I say integrity, uh, most of us have probably already a good working uh, definition in our mind of what that means. Like, we kind of understand, in general, what integrity means. But really quick, let's go ahead and define it. It can be defined as the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. It can be defined as moral uprightness and uncompromising adherence to strong moral and ethical principles and values. I was thinking about uh, Job this past week, interestingly, you guys may know the story of Job. One day, God and uh, his divine counsel are having a meeting up in the heavens, and Satan shows up. And God's like, what have you been up to? And Satan's like, oh, you know, roaming to and fro the earth. And God knew what he meant. He was looking for somebody to mess with. And so God said, have you considered my servant Job? Which is kind of uncool. You know what I mean? <laughs> but God must have trusted Job, right? And here's what God says. Have you considered my servant Job? Listen to what he says. There is none like him on the earth. And listen to these descriptors. A blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast his integrity. Although you incited me against him, destroy him without a reason. Well, you didn't, there wasn't even a reason. 
because of his integrity. What's interesting, if you know the story you've read on, is you know that after they had lost just about everything, his wife was just fed up. And because he, he's still praising God and like, God, you're still awesome. And she's like, are you serious right now? We've lost just about everything, our stuff, our kids. I mean, what? And she says, how is it that you are still holding on to your integrity? Notice that even here, you can see it on the screen, integrity isn't defined as perfection. It's a quality of being. We are called to be like Christ. And the picture of who Jesus is can be found in the Bible. The values, the principles, the ethics that we live by are found in God's holy word. Do you agree? I love the way that Paul says it. This is just great. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 21. Paul says that we aim at what is honorable. Honorable. This is kind of a similar word. Like we hear honorable and we have kind of a framework of what that means. Very similar to integrity. And Paul says that that's what we're aiming for. We aim for what is honorable. Get the picture. The picture of somebody looking down the arrow of a, a bow and arrow and getting ready to shoot. And what they're aiming at is integrity. It's honor. It's honorability. It's honor. All the words that fit into that synonym in like synonyms. You guys, my cold medicine is starting to kick in. But y'all are with me, right? He says we aim at what is honorable. Not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. And then in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, this is Paul again. He says, brothers, and we know this one, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, there's that word again, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable. Here's what's crazy about that word. It doesn't even have to be a righteous or unrighteous issue. It's just whatever is commendable. There's all kinds of things that are commendable. He's like, bro, whatever is even commendable. If there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. There is a state of mind. There's a way of living that followers of Jesus are aiming for. But how many of you know, we don't always hit the mark. Anybody ever miss the mark? Anybody ever aimed? I aimed, but doggone it, if I didn't shoot one straight out into the woods instead. You guys know what I'm talking about? Interestingly enough, the number one definition of sin is missing the mark. First John chapter two, verse one, John says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that I'm putting these things down on word. I have cut up a tree, a papyrus tree. I am putting these words on a papyrus scroll so that you will not sin because that's the goal. We want to hit a bullseye every time. That's the goal. I'm doing all this, saying all this, putting it in your hand, making it accessible to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, I love it because he's a realist. He knows what the Bible tells us over and over again. That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm doing all this so that you won't sin. But when you do sin, <laughs> we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is our sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. I love that. And I want you to listen. His perfection covers our imperfection. But our commitment is to do the very best that we can to live our lives according to the integrity, the moral excellence found in the word of God. Amen, saints. 
Let me show you this verse here because this, this is just a great scripture um, to consider when we're talking about this subject. This is Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9. It says, one who walks in integrity walks securely. This is already looking good, ain't it? But one who perverts his ways will be found out. Now, we've already uh, defined integrity. It's the commitment to biblical principles and values, right? But let's define this other word here, perverts. It's interesting because when we see that word, you see it up there. When we see that, the first way we want to pronounce that is perverts. And, and we use it um, to describe someone that is um, sexually twisted. Someone who is just in their brain, in their hearts, and in their actions, they are full of indiscretion when it comes to sexuality. And they're just perverts. And it's not a bad descriptor, descriptor. It works, right? But the word is pervert, okay? He says, but one who perverts his way. That word simply means to distort or corrupt a thing. To distort or corrupt a thing. True or false, any one of us could distort or corrupt anything. Yes. Listen, there's a 50-50 chance you'll get that one right. All right? It's a true or false statement, you know. Yes. So, true or false, any one of us could distort or corrupt anything. True. You all passed. Okay. When a person looks at pornography, they are corrupting a God-given desire for sexuality. They are distorting God's moral way of fulfilling sexual desires. Isn't that right? When a person lies... They are distorting the truth because they have a corrupted view of themselves or someone or something that makes them believe they can't just be truthful in that moment. Every one of us are tempted every day to distort or corrupt good and godly things in our lives. But we have to keep aiming for what is honorable. Are y'all with me? Amen. And really quick, um, look at the results of these two lifestyles. I don't know if y'all can see that up there, but, but we see two different lifestyles, lifestyle options. And the results are a person with, who walks in integrity walks securely, meaning they don't have to walk around worried every second about like, oh, somebody going to know, somebody going to find out, am I going to get, right? They don't have to worry about that because they've been walking in a manner that is worthy of Jesus. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Versus a person who perverts his way, what does it say? Will be found out. How many of you know the finding out is never fun? And that's what we're about to see. Acts chapter 5. Let's dive in. We're going to read through this. And while we're going, I want to give you three things a church needs in order to walk in integrity. Okay, so get ready to write these things down. They're super simple, but they're very important. If you've been here before, then you know that this is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Most of us know the story. And it is a crazy one. Okay. In my opinion, though, their story actually starts back in Acts chapter 4, which is where we were last week. But let's scooch on back there um, for the time being, because really, Ananias and Sapphira, their story starts back in chapter 4, specifically in verse 32. Okay, so Acts 4.32, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. 
And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Y'all look up here. This is a big deal. What we just read, this is a big deal. These people, excuse me, these people trusted these church leaders to steward their stuff with integrity. As a church leader, I can tell you that this by far is the most humbling and fearful, not as in scaredy cat, but as in careful tasks for leaders that should be taken very seriously. And we do take it very seriously here at Soma Church. And I want to say thank you for trusting us with your finances, but also trusting us with your families, for trusting us with your marriages, for trusting us with your children. Really, really appreciate your trust in this church. Our team works really hard to lead the saints at Soma Church with integrity. In fact, that leads me to number one. Leaders of the church must lead with integrity. I know that that sounds like a duh statement. But it's amazing how this fact, by and large, is being forgotten in the church today. That leaders must lead their church, their congregations, their people with integrity. Amen? It's important for a church to be able to trust their leaders. One guy in particular really trusted these apostles. Verse 36 in, in chapter 4 says, And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. Okay, so the apostles gave this guy a nickname. We just call him Barnabas. That dude knows how to encourage people. It says that Barnabas was a Levite of the country of Cyprus. Having land, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, we're going to hear more about Barnabas as we work through the book of Acts. And so, but for now, I just want to um, show two important things, okay? It says that he was a Levite uh, of the country of Cyprus. You need to know that land in Cyprus at that time would have been prime real estate, which means that what Barnabas gave to the church was a massive amount of money. And everybody would have been talking about it because it says that they had all things in common, right? Okay, but apparently this Joseph guy was more than just a generous guy giver, more than just generous with his stuff, apparently he was also known to be generous with his words because they called him Barnabas, son of encouragement. Point being, this guy was highly respected by the people, okay? Now, let's turn over to Acts chapter 5, which starts with, but... A certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Your translation may say also sold a possession. It starts out with but, right? First thing we read here is but. As in, in contrast 
two. Several weeks ago, we talked about how Luke was the writer of the Gospel of Luke, but he's also the one who wrote the book of Acts. And so for Luke to bring up these two stories means that he was doing it with a purpose, okay? And his purpose was to bring attention for bringing attention to Barnabas's gift and his heart and his lifestyle is because he was about to contrast it with a whole nother way of living. It says, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, also sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Remember earlier I said that this story is where we see for the very first time people in the church choose self over God. It's the first time we see someone choose the flesh over the spirit. Okay? Another biblical fact that has been forgotten, maybe even more so than the fact that leaders need to be leading with integrity, is number two, members of the church must live with integrity. Not only do leaders need to live and lead with integrity, but y'all, the members of the church do too. Listen, members often hold leaders to a standard that they themselves don't actually live by. I've seen it for years. It's amazing. Someone will come up to me and, and, and correct me or say something about the, the goofiest little, well, you looked at me funny. It's like, yeah, well, you're a murderer, you know? <laughs> no, that's never happened. But it, it can be that silly. No, seriously, guys. We, we've gotten in the habit of, of, um, of acting like somehow the leader of a church is, one, is the one that carries the righteousness for the whole church. As if we are the Savior and how we live or don't live is going to determine the righteousness for everybody. So you better hold it together, Pastor, otherwise I will die in my sin. I know that's extreme, but it's, it's amazing how people will give themselves permission to not live a life worthy of the calling. Because somebody else is holding that standard. It's just, it's just gotten really weird. So I'm telling you, members of the church must also live with integrity. Amen, saints? Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Now, you need to understand that there's no way that Peter could have known this. Okay, what Ananias and Sapphira did, they did in secret. But the Holy Spirit came upon Peter and gave him what we call a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is one of the nine ministry gifts or manifestation gifts that the Apostle Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. A word of knowledge just means you know something supernaturally that there's no way you could have known that. But the Holy Spirit showed him. He says, why has Satan filled your heart to do this thing? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Meaning, man, nobody told you how much to get. Nobody told you to sell the property. Nobody told you how much of the earnings you should give to the church. Nobody, this is not our business. This is your business. But the bad business is that you lied about it. Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. Number three, really quick. Works of the flesh must be addressed. Peter did what Peter should have done. Peter called out a work of the flesh. Works of the flesh must be addressed addressed. I want you to hear me, church. If there's one thing the general church populace cannot handle, 
it's correction. Christians don't like correction. We don't like it. Am I wrong? I don't know why, but whenever I was writing some of these things down, um, a pie chart um, came into my mind. And I know you guys equate charts and pie charts and things like that with Joe, and rightfully so. (laughs) But what you don't know is that I geek out over those really bad. Oh, yes, I just don't know how to create them. (laughs) So Joe knows how to create them, and then I just geek out over them. Okay, I really like them. But anyway, I saw, I was thinking about this, and I saw a pie chart in my head, and it was filled out. And these numbers may be a little loose, but they're but they're pretty close. They're pre- pretty accurate. And it, the pie chart relates to how, um, how people have moved on from Soma Church. Um, Soma Church is 17 years old. Over the years, people have, have moved on. You understand? I want you to listen to this pie chart. About 10%, roughly, 10% of people who move on from Soma simply move. Like they just moved to another city or they moved to another state. You guys remember last fall... Uh, Ken and Becca Reed, who is our worship director, and Ken was on staff for years. Um, he got a job at Dave Ramsey, and, and they moved to Tennessee. We are sad about it, but good things c- coming for them, right? Uh, but they, they aren't here anymore. Why? Because they, they moved. About 10% of the people that move on from Soma Church simply move location. Like they locate somewhere else. Another 10% of people who move on from Soma move on because of um, unreasonable offenses. Okay, just offended by unreasonable things. I mean, I, and I, ha- I, have, I have a list of things I could work through. I mean, just some wild stuff. I remember years ago, there was a, a family that left. The husband was upset with me because I didn't come visit him in the hospital at the same time his father was in the hospital. I said, we're leaving the church. Why? Well, you didn't come visit me in the hospital. You were in the hospital? I didn't even know he was in the hospital. I didn't go visit somebody in the hospital if you don't even know they're in the hospital. Right? I said, bro, I didn't know you were in the hospital. Well, you should have. <laughs> you know I'm not Jesus, right? <laughs> Had I known that he, and I don't even really know his father, but I might have visited him too. I just didn't know, Right? So it was a little bit unreasonable. And we've had all kinds of, I'm, I'm leaving the church because so-and-so looked at me weird. I'm like, we well, you know so-and-so is weird, right? <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect, man? They are kind of weird. I mean, just all kinds of things. Just people that just leave for unreasonable offenses, okay? Now, there's 5%, roughly, that move on for some sort of um, legitimate disappointment or unmet expectation. For example, maybe Soma um, didn't have the program that they really needed in that season of their life. I know when, when Soma first started, we didn't have a kids ministry. And so we were primarily young adults, but those young adults started getting married and having kids and we didn't have a kids ministry. And so they began moving on to churches that actually had um, an established children's ministry. And I didn't begrudge that. I thought, well, that's what you need. That's where you're at in this season. There was a season where we didn't have a youth ministry. We just didn't have one. We didn't have any youth, you know, but people started coming and they loved the worship and you know, they loved the teaching. And so they wanted to stay. <laughs> But we didn't have a youth ministry, right? And so they said, we love it here, but we have to go find a church that has a youth ministry. Most of the time, I would send them to a church that had a great youth ministry. Oh, you need to go there. They have a great youth ministry. Okay, so that's a valid reason. We just didn't have what they need. Sometimes um, it's an unmet expectation, a legitimate unmet expectation. Not long ago, there was a guy that let me know that they were going to move moving on from the church. And I said, really? Huh, Why? And he said, you, you remember when we had that conversation, I was sharing with you the things that I was going through, and it was a hard season, and we met, and you talked, and you encouraged me and all the things. I said, yeah, of course. He said, I just don't feel like you followed up with me very well after that. And I said, you know what? You're right. I didn't. 
And the reality is it was a very busy season for me. It was actually the season when Ken and Becca moved and we were trying to figure out who's going to lead worship and all the things. It's a, uh, it's a reason. It's not an excuse, but it is a reason. And I said, will you please forgive me? Because that's not the way I want to shepherd people here. And I'm sorry. But you're right. I didn't follow up with you like I would normally and should have. And it was a great conversation. So people move on from different things. Stuff like that happens. Do you understand? It's church. We're people. But here's what I want to tell you. 75% of the people who have moved on from Soma Church have left because they were corrected. And I will take that percentage to the bank. Have moved on simply because they were corrected. In one way or another, they were acting in a way that is unbecoming of a follower of Jesus, and they needed to be corrected. They could not handle it, and so they moved on. And there's all kinds of things that any one of us could be um, corrected, fleshly deeds of the flesh that could be addressed. In fact, let's get into Galatians 5 really quick. Galatians chapter 5 says, Paul says, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh craves what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are opposed to each other, so that you do not do what you want. You may not know this about the Apostle Paul's writings and letters, but a central theme in all his letters is that battle, that tension between the spirit and the flesh. You see it over and over and over again in his writings. And so he lays it out right here. Walk by the spirit and you won't desire the, uh, gratify the desires of the flesh. Listen, this whole thing, this is why the church will never be perfect. It's filled with people who are still learning not to fulfill the desires of the flesh. And it's why leaders must lead with integrity, why members must live with integrity, so that when it's time to address someone who is operating in the flesh, we can do it securely. Anybody ever felt just a little insecure about having to confront that person for what they did or what they said? Anybody know that feeling? Any, anybody ever had a hard time confronting a deed of the flesh? You know as well as I do, that is no fun. It is no fun having to correct someone. We all know it. Proverbs 10 9 again, it says, One who walks in integrity walks securely, but one who perverts his way will be found out. When we see someone whose way is perverted, when we see someone living according to the flesh, we all have to be committed to say something. Are y'all hearing me? Yes. We got to be committed to say something. I mean, how many times we sweep something under the rug? It's like that should never have been swept under the rug. Somebody should have said, why has Satan filled your heart to do such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it like Peter did it. Now, that might be a little too intense, but we got to say something, right? It says the acts of the flesh are obvious. Okay, so what are these acts? Well, he says they're, they're obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, sexual stuff's always at the top of the list, and I think we all know why, because we, we know why. <laughs> sexual immorality, impurity, uh, debauchery, Idolatry, idolatry, sorcery, and he's like, y'all, he's playing flesh pinball here. I mean, he's bouncing all over the place. There is no rhyme or reason to what he's even saying. Hatred, discourse, jealousy, rage, rivalries, divisions, factions. If you don't know what a faction is, a faction is a group of people that kind of gather up under some unified uh, offense 
or preference, and they start attacking the rest of the body. It's like a virus, okay? You want to know what a faction is? Think about what a virus is. That's what a faction is, okay? He says viruses, uh, no, he says, divi- uh, he says factions, <coughs> rivalries, divisions, factions, and then he says envy. Again, he's bouncing around, drunkenness, orgies, and then he's like, yo, I can't do this all day. We got to stop this at some point, and so he just says, and the like, you guys, we talk about how Paul has this list, and he just gets started, and he's like, I can't finish this up. So he says, and such as these, or and the like. And I want you to think about what he's saying. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Like, we know what is integrous and what's not. We know what is right and what's wrong. We know what it means to walk with biblical integrity, especially those of us who've been part of the church for an extended amount of time. You know what I have found? Remember we talked about that 75% that move on when they're corrected? You know what I found? Nine times out of ten, it's the people that most would consider spiritually mature that can't handle correction. But I'm here to tell you, a mature Christian, a mature Christian that can't handle correction is not a mature Christian at all. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And then in 21, he says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who practice such things, again, we all know what those things are. We know what the stuff is. We know what makes the list and what doesn't. Those who practice such things. And I want you to think about that. Practice. They practice those things, right? Remember how we're aiming for what is honorable? Well, there are people who are aiming at what is dishonorable. And you know, they're pretty good at it because they practiced. Before I knew Jesus, I was pretty good at a few things that I should not have been good at. And the reason I was good at it, because I had a lot of practice. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Now I'm pretty good at some spiritual things only because I have practiced. He's saying those who have practiced practiced such things, those who practice those deeds of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. They had just got too good at that stuff. And this is why we correct. Because we love, we love our friends, we love our family, and we don't want them returning to that old uh, perverse way of living. Isn't that right? And so we don't want to sweep it under the rug. That ain't going to get them to heaven. We say, brother, don't do that. There's a better way. Verse 22, we know this. This is the fruit of the Spirit. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things. So there's another one of those lists that he just didn't have time to finish. Right? We talked last week about how empathy is a fruit of the Spirit. Compassion is a fruit of the Spirit. Humility is a fruit of the Spirit. Specifically, last week, we talked about how confidence is a fruit of the Spirit. There's all kinds of things that are fruits of the Holy Spirit. Against such things, there is no law. Verse 24, those who belong to... Are y'all still with me? Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We've crucified the flesh. Since we live by the Spirit, let us walk in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and env- everybody say, envying one, envying one another. Put that one on the shelf. We're going to come back to that. Okay, look again real quick at how Peter addressed Ananias. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie against the Holy Spirit? What? Y'all, where do you think he learned how to address the flesh? Where did he learn that? He learned it from Jesus. He was the recipient of such a statement one day. You remember? Jesus just let the cat out of the bag. I'm going to die. And Peter said, oh, no, you're not. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You don't have your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. And what did Peter know about Ananias 
and Sapphira. They didn't have their, their thoughts on the things of God, but on the things of men. And it says in verse 5, on hearing these words, Ananias fell down and died. And great fear came over all who heard what had happened. Then the young men stepped forward, wrapping up his body, and carried him out and buried him. Must have been a big guy. All the old guys were like, oh, young men do it. I got a bad back. You know, the young men said, we'll do it. Verse 7 says, about three hours later, his wife also came in, unaware of what had happened. And Peter says, hey, is this the price that you and your husband um, got for the land? And she said, oh, yes, that's, that's the price. And Peter says, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that instant, she fell down at his feet, and she died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and all who heard about these events. I guess so. I mean, these people just keeled over dead. Now, I've been asked um, over the years, why did these people fall over dead in that moment? And I, I, to be honest, I have no idea. Okay, there's all kinds of conjecture and thoughts on why that these people died. I've heard um, before that maybe they were uh, in shock that they were actually caught, that someone actually knew what they had conceived in private and they like had a heart attack. Maybe they were older or something. I don't know. And they just killed over dead. I don't know if that's true. But what I have come to learn is that for most Christians, living in compromise, their greatest fear is not in sinning, itself, but in being found out. By the way, some would say that the sin of uh, Ananias and Sapphira was greed. And I suppose that was, you know, part of the mix. But their sin was, one, lying. They lied. They distorted the truth about what they gave. Why would they do that? Because... Number two, of pride, a corrupted sense of self-worth inside of them. At the end of the day, what were they trying to be? Just like Barnabas, esteemed, admired, perceived as spiritual and generous, but they weren't. And so they lied because their own self-worth somewhere deep down was just corrupted. And so the whole thing was perverted. Here's how I want to end. We were just in Galatians chapter 5. And I want us to end with Galatians chapter 6. And it's going to be up on the screen. And I want you to read along with me, not out loud, because I want to read out of the Amplified Version, which can be a little harder to follow So, um, and when reading out loud. So just look at it and read with me. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any sin, you who are spiritual... That is, you who are responsive to the guidance of the Spirit are to restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness, not with a sense of superiority or self-righteousness, keeping a watchful eye on yourself so that you are not tempted as well. Carry one another's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the requirements of the law of Christ, that is, the law of of Christian love. For if anyone thinks he is something special, when in fact he is nothing special except in his own eyes, he deceives himself. But each one must carefully scrutinize his own work, examining his actions, his attitudes, and behavior. 
And then he can have the personal satisfaction and the inner joy of doing something commendable. Interesting that that was on that list earlier. Remember, whatever is noble, whatever is true. Further in the list, it says whatever is commendable. Doing something commendable without comparing himself to another. Remember, this is what got this started for Ananias and Sapphira to begin with, comparing themselves to another. What did Paul say back in chapter 5? Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. Y'all, we got to get that stuff inside of us healed up. Because it's going to come out. And when it comes out, it's going to come out perverted. Why? Because it's corrupted. It's not right. Then he ends with, every person will have to bear with patience his own burden of faults and shortcomings for which he alone is responsible. And that's really the way that I want to close this morning. So I just want to remind everyone of all three of these things. Leaders must lead with integrity. Members must live with integrity. And then we've got to be able to address the deeds of the flesh. If I'm ever acting in the flesh, come up to me and say, bro, why has Satan filled your heart with that thing? And the same thing. I remember one time I had to um, meet with a guy. I said, I'd like to meet with you. And I may have shared this story before. This has actually happened many times with many different men. And I, I usually wait to a third time because they say third time's a charm, right? Or third, three, three strikes are out, however you say that. I don't know. I'm starting to get a little fuzzy here. I said, I want to talk to you. This is the third time that I've heard, to you, heard you speak to your wife that way, in a way that was demeaning and embarrassing. And that's not right. We are called to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And I can't ever imagine a scenario where Jesus would talk to you that way. And for you to talk to your wife that way, it's unbecoming, brother. And I want to encourage you don't know what that's rooted in. I don't know where that's coming from. I don't know if that seems to be the culture of your marriage, the culture of your home. But I tell you what, you fix that and you are in for the honeymoon of your life. Now, I've already told you the percentage. 75% of the men that I would say something like that can't handle the truth. And they leave. Don't you want someone to tell you when you're acting in a way that's unbecoming? Yeah. Don't you want someone to share with you when you have a blind spot that you can't see? And all somebody has to do is show you that blind spot. And it can course correct. If you had a blind spot, don't you want someone to keep you from getting into an accident? Right? Right? If someone has the ability to help you aim towards what is honorable, yeah, just a little to the left. There you go. Let go. Don't you want that? I know that I do. And I tell you what, if the church would embrace this, we would see less crap in the media that we're seeing. Amen? Amen. So... Some of you may be like, I'm going to send you an email about how you said crap in the pulpit. <laughs> and I probably shouldn't have, so forgive me. I want to pray for us. As I'm praying, um, our, our ministry team will come forward. And if you need prayer for anything, I would encourage you to come. Maybe it's related to the sermon. Maybe it's just a general need for encouragement. Uh, but, Lord, I pray right now for everyone in the room, and we say thank you for the way that you love us, and you lead us, and you did live a life that is worthy, and that's why you are the spotless 
lamb of God who was slain. We could never take care of our own sin. We could never atone for our own failures and shortcomings. Only you, Jesus, have the ability to do that. And so we worship you and we praise you and we thank you for that. Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus for anyone in the room right now that has a um, um, some sort of um, fleshly desires that has um, its hooks in them, and it's been a battle to get over that, um, that issue. Lord, we also recognize that sometimes it takes time to get through and over um, those things. And so we pray out of compassion and empathy. We all know that it's not easy. Would you work by your spirit to heal those broken places and restore us um, um, in those ways that we need to be? We pray life and blessing over everyone in this room. And we say that we trust you, Jesus. We trust you. You are the only one who is trustworthy. So um, as a reminder, as we close, we don't look to man. We don't look to um, platforms. We don't look to positions. We look to the King, Jesus. We look to you. We take our cues from you. We pray these things together in Jesus' name. Amen.